Welcome to the HPC Best Practices uh, webinar series. The series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the uh, United States Department, Department of Energy. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I'll be the host for today's webinar, the Open SSF Best Practices Badge Program, and the webinar will be presented by Ro uh, Ross Bartlett. Uh, from Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, Ross earned his PhD in chemical engineer from Carnegie Mellon, where he did research on numerical approaches for solving large scale constraint optimization uh, problems in chemical processes engineering. Then he went to Oak Ridge and Sandia, uh, where he continued to uh, work on uh, doing research and development in constrained optimization, sensitivity methods, and large scale numerical software design integration for computational science and uh, engineering, CSE. Ross currently focuses on software engineering challenges in CSE, uh, as well as development of build, test, and integration software and process for CSE. We have issued about 100 tickets for today's webinar. Uh, not everybody shows up, but uh, we have muted uh, all uh, attendees upon entry. But, uh, at least I tried here. So we'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc, whose address I'll paste in the chat momentarily. We have asked Ross to add breaks during his presentation so he can respond to the questions that come in. With that, Ross, I'll stop my sharing and take over. All right, thank you, Osni. All right, so can everybody see okay? Yes. Excellent. Right, so I'm gonna talk about the Open SSF Best Practices Badge Program. So this is something that um, I came across about two years ago, and I was just really impressed by the scope and the breadth of the program. And I thought it was a really useful uh, program and with a lot of very interesting features and benefits that I thought could really uh, benefit our community. So I wanna point out that um, I wrote a, a article on this on the Better Scientific Software site about a year ago. And I recently updated it with some more recent statistics about the site. And a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today in this, in this Presentation is also uh, discussed in that in that uh, article on BSSWIO. So one thing I want to address right up front here is that um, one of the S's in Open SSF stands for security, the Open Source Security Foundation, and I want to talk about issues of security up front here and kind of put them in context within these best practices. So there's been increased interest and concern about software security in general for the last several years. And uh, in the last couple of years, we had this executive order uh, on the improving the nation's cybersecurity that came out, uh, uh, order 14028 uh, from the White House. And so a few, a few key quotes from that executive order Incremental improvements will not give us the security we need. Uh, the federal government must bring to bear the full scope of its authorities and resources to protect and secure its computer systems. And all federal information systems should meet or exceed the standards and requirements for cybersecurity that are set forth in this order. Uh, you know, there's debated at different institutions about what constitutes, I guess, a federal information system. But uh, you know, I know that we're being impacted at that at at, uh, at my organization. We're feeling the impacts of this of this of this executive order and some increased emphasis on trying to improve our security in different ways. So this is one of the drivers for this. So just in general, um, if you do a Google search or a web search on open source security vulnerabilities or issues, you'll find a whole bunch of articles. Here's just a sampling of some that I found when I searched just recently. Uh, for example, one of these articles is about the Heartbleed bug in this open SSL package, very critical package for our security infrastructure. And so what's, what's interesting about that is that the open SSL Heartbleed bug was exposed and it was fixed in the source way back in 2014. 
And they're still writing articles about it eight years later for the impact that that has. So a natural question to ask, and everyone's gonna ask it, and frankly, I asked this myself recently is, how does software security impact computational science and engineering and the high performance computing communities? Well, a couple things. Well, first, just the general and cautious usage of software systems can create problems for our, our institutions. You know, I know that we've all, in all our institutions, recently we've had, you know, you know, yearly or more frequent cybersecurity trainings to avoid, you know, clicking on links and suspicious emails and text messages and so forth. I mean, when I was at Oak Ridge, they had a major uh, security uh, issue years ago that cost, you know, quite a while to recover from and, and so forth. Um, and, you know, institutions are having problems all the time. So, you know, the software installs that you do, for example, can create vulnerabilities in our systems and our customer systems through the software that we're installing or even how they're installed. You know, and even some of our, you know, CSC, HPC software itself may actually get run in, in environments in sort of, you know, user-facing environments that could open up security vulnerabilities for those applications, depending upon, you know, how our software is written and what vulnerabilities it has. And then the increasing usage of workflows and pipelines and containers for, you know, for, for DevOps, for our CSC HVC projects brings with them a lot of different possible security vulnerabilities. So with that, um, let me just uh, define the Open Source Security Foundation. Hold on. Let me make this thing go away. So this irritating thing is not going away from my, um, my slide here. Okay, here we go. Right, so the Open SSF stands for the Open Source Security Foundation. This is a, a foundation um, under the Linux Foundation. It's a cross industry organization. It brings together the industry's open source security initiatives and individuals. And their vision is a future where participants in open source software ecosystem use and share high quality software where security is handled proactively and by default as a matter of course. And the foundation is supported uh, primarily by its premier members uh, that provide the funding for it. And it basically includes all the major uh, tech companies in the industry. Some of the more major ones that we all know about are shown here. So is there any questions up to this point? Not yet, Russ. Excellent. Okay. Now let's let me provide an overview of this best practices badge program and why I think it's so useful. So this is a set of best practices that have been curated by the open source community for projects that are actually using them. And they have very specific actionable criteria and require supporting evidence. This is different from a lot of other best practices efforts that I've seen that are kind of high level. It's not clear what to actually do to satisfy these things, where these are very specific. Um, and they give you uh, very, very specific advice what's needed to satisfy them and where to look for more information. And I'll show some examples of that. Now, what's particularly you know, unique about this set of best practices is that there's a very strong focus on software security. Uh, you know, which partially addresses the this White House executive order, for example, and this applies to, you know, U.S. government, national laboratory, and so forth. Uh, but I want to so so while this comes from the OpenSSF uh, Foundation, and it has a really strong security focus, I want to point out that you know most of these practices are applicable to all software and not just to security critical software. <clears throat> and for those practices that you know, are specific for security critical software, a lot of them just don't apply to the kind of software that we develop you know, day in and day out. So I don't want people to write, these, you know, write off these best practices just because there's a security focus to it. But I will talk about some of the implications of, of this set of best practices related to security, which are somewhat challenging. So one of the, you know, another unique feature of this program is that there's this, you know, very featureful quote badge app site that enhances the display of each practice, expanded descriptions of the practices, and it provides a way for projects to create um, entries 
for their for their project to check off which practices that they follow and how they address them in order to find out more information. So once a project has created an entry on the badge app site, then they can basically display that badge or what progress they've made to a badge on their own project's hosting site. And with links back to the OpenSSF uh, project page for that project. So what I found from working with this is that I think this set of practices is a pretty effective learning tool. Um, and I'll talk more about that later. It, it also provides a roadmap for continue for continual improvement in a project as it incrementally adopts more practices and improves its scores in different areas. Another benefit is that it provides a standard index into parts of a project and how it handles different kinds of processes. And finally, um, I think actually the way this is implemented and the way it's documented, I think this might actually provide a pretty attractive sort of template to kind of fork this you know, badge app site and you can modify it and customize it for you know, less than open source projects and some of our internal uh, programs, for example. Uh, get rid of this bar here, let's see, okay. All right, so let me find an overview of the best practices program. Okay, so the best practices are broken down and organized in several different ways. First, uh, practices can either be required or optional, and there's two levels of optional. So the ones that are required are listed as must, with the word must in it, although many of those can be marked as not applicable if they don't apply to your project or your kind of software. And then there's practices that are listed as should, or suggested and should practices, if you don't follow them, you have to provide a rationale for why you're not doing it. Now the practices are broken down into three different badge levels. There's a passing level, there's a silver level and a gold level. And each level adds additional practices that are required or suggested. And within those three different badge levels, the practices are broken down into six different categories. Uh, of which security is only one of those categories. And then each category is broken down into one or more subcategories. So this is what the practices look like, the way they're displayed. So it's showing the practices for the, you know, for the level of the badge, in this case, the passing level, this is the basic category, and then the basic project website subcategory. For example, uh, the first one there is the project website must provide information how to obtain provide feedback and then and so forth and each of these practices has a unique uh, short identifier name for the practice so, so it's not ambiguous and that and and that uh, short identifier is also a link onto the onto the website that basically defines the practice so you can provide web links to these things by just putting in that short link name so here's a sampling of some of the practices at the passing level, just so you can see sort of what these look like. So again, at the basic project level, the project has to describe what the software does, what problem does it solve. The project website must provide information on how to obtain and provide feedback. I already mentioned that one. Information on how to contribute um, must be provided. Um, and then it's optional to provide criteria for how, you know, for how, you know, for, for what contributions will be accepted essentially. And some of these have URLs that are required to point to more detailed information or how that practice is satisfied. So over on change control, the project has to use version control. And it's got to be in a public, at least read-only repository. The project source repository has got to track what changes are made, who made the changes, and why they were made. And it's got to enable collaborative review to allow for review of intern versions of the software you know, in between releases and not just you know, doing reviews of final releases. And it's suggested to use a distributed version control software like Git, but these days pretty much everybody uses Git, I think. So more examples of sample practices at the basic passing level. So on the reporting category and bug reporting process, the project has got to provide a process by which users 
uh, can submit bug reports. That's the report process. The project should use an issue tracking system, but doesn't have to. The project must acknowledge major bugs that reported within the last two to 12 months inclusive. Uh, but the response need not uh, include a fix. That's interesting. Um, I guess your software is allowed to have bugs and it's still be passing. The project should respond to the majority of enhancement requests within the, you know, the last uh, uh, two to 12 months. It actually doesn't require you to respond to all enhancement requests just at the passing level. Uh, and your project must provide a publicly available archive to search uh, prior bug reports and responses. On the vulnerability reporting process, your project has to provide us a sort of a secure way to support vulnerabilities uh, in your software somehow. So over here under quality, under working build system. So if your software has to be built, it's got to provide a way to automatically build it from source. You can't still be able to type in compile commands. And this one is an example of a practice that can be marked as not applicable because all software doesn't have a build process like Python, for example, is just the interpreter. Um, the project must have at least one automated test suite that's publicly available as open source software. And new functionality, and, and there must be a general uh, policy that is new functionality is added that, that's, that that functionality gets tested. Well, this kind of squishy term here that uh, the test for the functionality should be added to the automated test suite. It doesn't say that it has to be, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so last, um, you know, a third set of samples that you'll see at the passing level on security. And I'll talk more about these two here, uh, secure software development. These are uh, quite different. Uh, the project must have at least one primary developer that knows how to design secure software. And the project, you know, one of the primary developers has to know the, the common kinds of security vulnerabilities. I'll, I'll talk more about these in detail later and why these are so interesting. Um, Over on the analysis side, uh, static analysis. So, you know, to, to reach a passing level, your project has to use a static analysis tool beyond just the basic compiler. Unless the language that you're using doesn't have any tools available for it, so you can mark it as not applicable and describe why. It's suggested that you use at least one static analysis tool uh, that can look for common vulnerabilities in the language that you're using. And of course, some languages don't, just doesn't have a tool for that, so you can mark that as not applicable if if you're one of those languages for your project. But you've got to fix all the medium and high security or you know, medium and high severity exploitable vulnerabilities that are discovered through the tool in a timely way. And it's suggested that you run this tool you know, very frequently. So I just want to point out you know, that most of these practices are applicable to almost all software and not just security critical software. So some of the uh, Criteria for the statistics themselves broken down into different categories and the number of must, should, and suggested uh, shown here. Uh, number of not applicable, those that require a URL and so forth. And by the way, if, if a practice requires a URL, if you don't put it in, you'll get an error because it actually searches to make sure that it can access that URL. So just some notes and observations about this. So all these practices that are listed here, the numbers are not all unique. Some of the practices are relisted at higher levels, going from suggested to should or should to required. For example, at the silver level, uh, the uh, bus level or the, the uh, bus factor practice, which says that your project has to have more than one primary developer that can make changes and, and can sustain the project. That's just a should practice at the silver level. It's not even mentioned at, at, at the basic passing level. It's relisted at the gold level as a must. You know, to be a gold level project, you have to have a bus factor of two or more. But I want to emphasize here, and I'll emphasize that more later, is that most of these practices are not specific to security. And even the ones that are specific to security can be marked as not applicable, which is the case for most CSC software that's not dealing with things like you know, encryption and authentication and so forth and other things. All right, so any questions about the practices? Hey, Ross. Yes. Yes, we have some questions here. So let me go, uh, let's see here. Do most Exascale projects provide information on how to contribute? 
Uh, do most exascale computing project projects? I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. The next one, can you clarify how should differs from suggested? Yeah, so basically, um, come over here. Yeah, so a should is something that if you don't do it, you have to give a strong argument why you didn't do it. So you have to provide a justification. You got to type in why your project didn't follow it. If it's suggested a lot of times, you can just hit not met without requiring a justification. So the idea was that your project would be viewed, you know, the practices that are should and not met would be would be reviewed by people with greater scrutiny than those that are just suggested. So does that answer your question? Yes, no? Yes. Okay. Right. Any other questions? All good. Okay. All right now, let's talk about the, the OpenSSF best practices badge app site, which I think is probably the most useful and unique part of this program. So this is the URL to the badge app site. It's under this uh, domain, uh, core infrastructure initiative. Um, so you actually will see on this site, uh, both open SSF best practices and also a core initiative. That was um, a prior initiative where this program was started under and then it was, uh, and then that, that program went away and it was superseded uh, with the open SSF uh, foundation. Anyway, so as of a couple of weeks ago, this, this site had 5,800 uh, registered projects on there um at all levels and the first project they put in was the badge app and that one is listed as gold i guess partially just to demonstrate how you're supposed to use this site and how you're supposed to fill in the fields and also uh just to show that you know they're following that you know that they're eating their own dog food essentially right essentially okay you know and some of the projects that have earned badges are shown over here their icons like the linux kernel other big ones, uh, you know, GitLab, uh, things you might be familiar with, OpenSSL that we mentioned earlier, curl, Node.js, and so forth. So with this badge status, you can select several different things. So this is, for example, all the gold level projects. So there's, you know, was currently 19 projects as of last week. Uh, the badge app, of course, is one of them. Another one, which is very comforting, is the Linux kernel itself is listed as gold. Another, you know, very critical project, curl. We're doing communication transfer of files. So yeah, you can search different levels of projects and see which ones satisfy different levels of criteria. So looking at the growth of the best practices site. So this is showing a, a chart of the number of registered projects on that site going back to 2016 when it was first created. And as you see, it's been growing very steadily over the last six years or seven years, I guess. Um, and actually, it's even accelerated recently here in the last year or so, which is interesting. So this shows that uh, you know this is a well accepted and adopted badge program and site. And just one thing I want to mention here: you'll see, you know, that you can actually reduce the number of projects that are actually added. So if you create a project and put it on there, and if uh, for some reason, you need, need to take that thing down. You don't like something about the this best practices program, or it's not appropriate for your project, or whatever. You can, you know, remove your project, and it will get wiped off the site essentially. So that's how you can see this thing actually drop down. Now let's look at some of the badge level and adoption statistics. So, you know, of the 5,800 projects that are registered as of the 5th of June, you know. 70% of those had achieved a passing level, but only about 0.8% or you know, eight out of a thousand achieved a silver level badge. And then only you know, 0.3% or three out of a thousand achieved the gold level badge. And I will, have, just on a side note, if you look over this, you'll see that there are several projects that are listed multiple times. Uh, and only one of those is sort of the official one. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, someone will you know, post something for a project that's not the official entry and they'll, I guess they'll gripe about the project or something. But um, yeah, so you know, all 1,500 of those 
of those entries registered are not like you know fully legitimate entries for those projects. So that skews the statistics a little bit. I don't know the exact number because that would be hard to determine exactly, but I just wanted to point that out. So this uh, chart uh, shows the the uh, growth and number of projects that are making progress or, or have achieved a passing level. So I should note that when you see the percentages, um, if you're at 100%, that means that you have satisfied all the criteria for the passing level badge. And then when you go above 100%, it means that you've achieved passing level and you're going toward silver or going toward gold. So if, if you're in the 100s, it means you've, you're passing and you're on your way to silver. If you're in the 200s, it means you've received a silver and you're on your way to a gold. And the 300 is the best you can get. So that's just the gold level. So this is what the best practices uh, badge app site for a project page looks like. So to try this out, I took one of my projects and I created an entry for it uh, a couple of years ago. And I spent quite a bit of time on this. Um, and I, so this is what it looks like for a project uh, for the, this is displaying the passing level right here. And this shows you the six different categories and the number of criteria in here that uh, you marked. Now I should note that uh, in order to receive, um, you know, a credit for a practice, it either has to be a, a must practice that you have uh, met or that has been marked not applicable, if it's not applicable, or if it should or suggested, you had to at least respond to it, even if even to say that you've not met it, but you have to acknowledge all the practices in all of these categories in some way. And I'll note that uh, I do not have a 100% passing badge because of one of, one of the security uh, level uh, criteria that I'll talk more about later in this presentation. Uh, but this is, what, this is what the site looks like. Now, this is what it looks like when you are you know, responding to one of the criteria. So this is the release notes criteria, you know, release underscore notes. It says that, uh, so, at, so at the passing level, your project must for each release, provide release notes that are human readable summary of the major changes. And this cannot be just a Git log from the last time you did a release. And you're required to provide a URL to describe that. So in the Tribbets project, um, I have a change log file that I've been updating according to what are suggested best practices for a change log. But actually, there are a lot of projects, even in ECP, that don't produce release notes. Okay, so once your project has created a entry in the badge app, then you can, you can display that badge on your various websites for your project. So this is inside the readme file on the GitHub page for the Tribbets project. And it shows that I'm achieving 99% on my way to a uh, best practices badge. Now, if you click the edit and look at it, uh, this, is in, this is in restructured text. Uh, there's also examples that you can find for this in Markdown for how to do this. But it provides two different links. One is the link that actually generates the badge for you, that creates that image, essentially. And the other is a target. Um, and again, um, so I mentioned the auction text, which is the pop-up here. You know, a lot of places you'll see that it says it's the CII best practices. Um, that was the old name for it, and it um, is now called the Open SSF Best Practices. So it's easy to display this badge on your various project websites. All right, so let me stop for, for a second and ask if there's any questions about this. Yes, Ross, there is one here. Yep. So does the Open SSF badge program install any software on the registrant system for verification purposes, or does the regist registrant just have to answer some questions on the web? It's all questions on the web. There's no software you have to download, uh, but you do have to provide links to evidence for a lot of the criteria. So again, this is for open source software. So the idea is that you would provide all this information would be open on the open web that the badge app site can get to. But yeah, there's but there's nothing that, that you have to download. It's all on the website. Okay, continue, please. Okay. So let me talk about some of the other benefits of the Open SSF Best Practices Badge Program. So one benefit that I found, at least for myself, is that uh, I think this is a pretty effective learning tool. 
So when you go to the full set of practices, so there's this page called Criteria under the main site, where it lists out the criteria for different levels or all the levels, and you can tell it to list additional information. And it gives you a lot of information about each of these practices and the motivation for them and how you can satisfy them, what the issues are and so forth. And then within the badge app itself on your project page, each practice has a little uh, button called show details that can go into greater detail about that practice. So you can learn about it and what it takes to satisfy it. And then there's like a show all details button at the top of the page um, of your project page. Now, you know, reading through all 129 of these best practices in detail and clicking on some of the links can easily take more than half a day or might take much longer depending upon the level of your familiarity with each of these areas. So, you know, I've been looking at, you know, I, I've been reading books on software engineering for many years, best practices, articles, and so forth. So, so I was familiar with a lot of these areas, but I wasn't always, um, I was surprised what was considered to be the current uh, state of the art for the best practice for some of those areas. So I actually learned a lot from going through this. And I think it took me probably more than half a day to go through all practices up through the gold level just to see what was involved with them. And I suspect some people that are newer to this might spend quite a bit more time than that just, um, just going through this material. So here's an example of what this additional information looks like. So in the area of free open source licenses, it says that, you know, uh, the software produced for the project uh, has to be released under a free open source license. And this is in the, the, uh, the basic passing level. So if you look at the details, it basically describes the definition of open source software, the, def the definition of open source licenses. It gives some common licenses that are, that are used for open source software. And then it's, it states that, you know, you have to select a license that is approved by the open source initiative by the Free Software Foundation, and it's gotta be acceptable by you know, the Debian and the Fedora uh, Linux distributions. Cause I mean, I think all of us would like to potentially see our open source software being able to be a candidate to be in one of the major Linux distributions, I think. Cause that makes it just available to everybody pretty easily. And then, you know, some of these have a rationale where they describe why this practice exists and why it's important. And sometimes there's links that come off of this. I mean, so, I mean, I'm, you know, I've, I've been looking at, at open source licenses for a long time, going back to graduate school. So this is an area I'm pretty familiar with. But if you're not familiar with open source licenses, you could spend, you know, many hours just on this one topic, looking through these links and seeing what's involved here and how it impacts your software. I mean, I mean, I mean, it could take, you know, days potentially uh, if you have some particularly, you know, tricky issues with your software and, and so forth. Anyway. All right, so this is what it looks like if you click the show details link inside of your projects or you know, any of the projects. Um, well, actually, this is only available in the edit mode, so it would be for your project when you're editing your project. You can either click show details or, or hide details if you're showing the details. So this is the same entry for the uh, uh, floss license, and it goes into the um, to, to the details, but it doesn't give the rationale here. The rationale is only given on that other criteria page. Okay, so another benefit is that you can use the OpenSF best practices uh, site and your project of that site as a way for helping you to work on continuous improvement. So for example, on the project page on the badge app for your project, you can you can basically show all the unmet criteria. And you do that by clicking on the expand panels and hiding the met criteria. Um, and what that'll do is that will show you all the criteria that uh, you marked as unmet or didn't respond to at all. But it will hide all the ones that you've met or marked as not as as, as not applicable. And you can do it based on the on the level that you're interested in. So the badge app. Site so will also send out periodic emails about the status of your project. And I'll show an example of that. All right, so this is what it looks like, for example, for the Triple Score project. When I clicked on the expand panels and hide uh, the, the met and, and the not applicable. So under change control, um, I met the unique version numbering as unmet in the basic level. It says it is suggested that the semantic versioning standard or the counter versioning standard is used. Um, 
And I listed that, you know, for for Tribits, it doesn't put on official releases, it just does, you know, almost continuous integration with its updates. So it's actually not required at the passing level to put out, you know, numbered releases or to follow any of these standards. It's just suggested. But in that it's, I mean, but you should know what's considered best practice, even if your project doesn't follow it. And I think that this is actually pretty helpful because I think very few projects actually follow the semantic versioning standard. Okay, so here's an example of an unmet criteria. So this is where the Trivets core project fails its passing badge. This is where it gets deducted uh, one out of that 16 of security practices that the project must have at least one developer who knows how to design secure software. And then there's details on exactly what those requirements are. And at this point in time, in good conscience, I cannot click uh, yes for that. And I'll talk more about this particular criteria later. Oh, and, and as I mentioned earlier, the Badge app site will send out periodic emails. This is an email I received back in April, reminding me that I've not yet received um, a passing uh, badge for my project and where to click on to modify it and how I can look for missing criteria and so forth. It's signed by David Wheeler, who's the, the lead of this, um, of this effort. He's also the lead of the working group for the best practices group in the OpenSSF Foundation. Okay, so another benefit of, of the uh, badge app site is that um, it actually provides a pretty useful standard index into projects. So the badge app project page, you know, gives a standard list of practices, it makes it easy to find out how a given project addresses, you know, certain types of issues and how to access those. I mean, the most basic example is, you know, how does a project handle issue reporting, which is, you know, I know is a required practice for the passing level. So every passing project has to do this. So I can just go to their project page, click on it, go to here and see how they how they do it. Now here I'm showing it for the badge app, you know, for the badge app project, project one. Um, and the click is met, and then they give a URL, and the URL is required. And in that case, you can either report issues through GitHub or you can use a mail list to report issues. So I mean, most projects do a pretty good job of describing how to report issues. But there's more obscure things. Like, for example, I was really curious about how this badge app site was actually implemented and whether we could actually uh, potentially clone this thing and use it for some of our internal projects because it's just open source software. Well, I knew that the best practices has, you know, a documentation architecture practice and it's um, actually required at the silver level. So I went there found that practice and found the link to the implementation documentation for their internal implementation. And from that, I was able to read about how they did it. So it's actually pretty interesting. You know, you can go to any of these projects that are on there. If you're curious about how that project does something, you can go and look at it. And that's actually a pretty interesting way to learn how different projects address these different uh, kinds of practices and criteria. And otherwise, this kind of standard index for projects just doesn't exist as far as I know. I know the ECP, and they've been trying to do this with the scientific, uh, with the, uh, well, sorry, with the software te technologies um, a project, but this is a much more comprehensive uh, version of that, I would say. All right, so any questions about that? Yes, there is one, uh, uh, Ross. Who decides what is a best practice? That's a, that's a great question. So in this case, uh, this is curated from the uh, from a community of people that are associated uh, initially with the core infrastructure initiative of the Linux Foundation. And it's pulled together by, you know, sort of, I guess, the you know, exemplar open source projects that are following these practices and I guess can make arguments for their value. So it's from the, com it's, it's from the community of people that uh, that curated those practices and um, and you and you can see lots of discussion about this if you want to if you go to their to their github site you'll see that people have asked questions about these issues you know early on there were some um, there's some refinement of, there's not much refinement lately because I don't think that they want to change them um, and you know kind of pull the rug out of different projects you know certainly they don't want to change the passing level let's say for example but um, yeah I mean that's a valid question right and 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 you want to make it clear that 
every practice is not applicable to every kind of software project. And that's why a lot of practices are listed as either suggested or should, or even just not applicable. So does that answer your question, Greg? Yeah, sorry, Ross. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that mostly does. Um, it just is there. Is there like a? Is is it just done by community consensus? Then is that to sum it up, or is there? Yeah, like I think a, that's um, correct. And okay. you know, and, and, but 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 part of it could simply be that these are the practices that they decided on if they're going to give you a badge, right? So by so by getting a passing badge in this program, what you're saying is that you have satisfied all the criteria that that particular project or program designated was, was you know, required, right, in order to be able to be considered passing. So in that sense, um, they get to define what best practice means because it's their badge. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, I've seen, you know, if you do web searches, you'll see that there are certain uh, projects and programs that will put out press releases and blog articles bragging that they have achieved a passing badge in the Open SSF program. So just go on Google and search for Open SSF or uh, CII best practices. You know, you know, achieving a badge or whatever, and then you'll see several articles that have been written for projects that are bragging that they've received this badge. Okay. So let's move on to the security practices. So much time do we have left here? Uh, let's see here. About another 10 minutes or so. Okay. Right. So let's talk about some of the security practices in a little bit more detail here where things get interesting. So what's interesting here is that open, the OpenSSL project, uh, they actually created two different entries in here. They created 87, uh, which marks uh, sort of where the OpenSSL project was before the Heartbleed bug. And then they have a current project, OpenSSL, for what they have done after the Heartbleed bug. So a couple things to learn about this. So before uh, the Heartbleed, first I should mention, Heartbleed bug, bug was identified and fixed back in 2014. This site itself didn't even come into existence until 2016. So these are all done after the fact, obviously. But um, yeah, I mean, so Heartbleed Blood, you know, OpenSSL only uh, achieved a 63% to a passing badge. Um, and again, a lot of the practices that you read there are pretty common sense stuff or things that you've read about or seen people do for at least a couple decades, probably. So a lot of these things are not, uh, shouldn't be shocks or surprises to most people. And then I guess today, uh, it's interesting that OpenSSL only achieves a passing badge. They haven't gotten past that. I mean, they've only gotten 5% past that to achieve a silver level. So I guess they just wanted to note that they achieved it and then and, and, and they moved on. Okay. Okay, so let's focus on the security practices themselves. So 16 of the 67 passing level practices are specifically for security under the security category. But nine of those 16, you can mark as not applicable. And, you know, for example, for my Trivus Core project, I mean, almost all of those were not applicable because a lot of those have to do with cryptography and authentication and things that most software doesn't actually deal with, really just security critical software. So, so 18 of the additional 55 several order practices are in the area of software security, but 11 of those can be marked as not applicable. And then five of the additional 23 of the gold level are security, and three of those five can be marked as not applicable. So, you know, until recently, software security was barely even mentioned in most software engineering books. So a classic example of this is sort of probably my favorite book on software engineering is Code Complete Second Edition, published back in 2014. That's a big book, it's 800 plus pages. And in that entire book, there's exactly one paragraph that is devoted to, to the air of software security. So in section 3.5 under architecture prerequisite, it says that the architecture should describe the approach to design level and code level security. If a threat model has not been previously built, it should be built at architecture time. Coding guidelines should be developed with security implications in mind. 
including approaches for handling buffers, rules for handling untrusted data, encryption level of detail contained in error messages, protected secret data that's in memory and other issues. I mean, he points out a lot of things here, but it's, you know, but it's, it's like, actually, is that even just one sentence? That's one sentence and it? it's not even a paragraph. No, actually, I'm sorry, it's two sentences. There's a period there. Um, but more recently, so I just got a copy of the Pragmatic Programmer, which is, you know, between, you know, Code Complete and the Pragmatic Programmer, that's on, you know, one of the two is on everyone's list of most recommended books to read on software engineering and software development. So in the 20th and Edition version, which came out in 2020, that's a much smaller book, 300 pages. They actually devote seven pages to the topic of software security under the topic 42, stay safe out there. So, um, one thing to note about this is that, you know, the awareness and visibility of software security is definitely increasing. You can see this in, in the literature and in terms of the different you know, programs that are basically pushing on this. And then of course, there's things like this White House executive order, uh, 14020 on software security that I mentioned earlier. So in my view, uh, for probably most projects and most people, these two passing level security uh, topics or criteria are the most difficult to satisfy, okay? So the project must have at least one primary developer who knows how to design secure software, and at least one of the project's primary developers must know the common kinds of errors. Uh, you know, what do they mean by no secure software? You know, you know how to design software, you know, or, or know the kinds of vulnerabilities. And when they know that, these are not even practices. These are not things that you have to actually do. These are really just asking the question, do you know what you're doing? And I don't, I can't think of any of the other 129 practices that are just asking the question, do you know what you're doing? Like, are you even educated enough to even answer these questions about the later questions about software security? And that's an, that's an interesting question, actually. So, so here is the, uh, here's the detail on the, you know, your project has to have one developer that knows secure design. So they go into details here and it says, you know, you got to know the basic eight critical principles from Schultzer and Schrodinger. And I cut this down a lot. There's way more detail. That's when you, you know, look at the details for this. You know, there's eight different, eight different areas, economy of mechanism, faults, you know, fail safe defaults, complete mediation, open design, separation of privilege, least privilege, least common mechanism, psychological acceptability, limited tax service and input validations with allow lists. And it basically says that a primary developer has got to be someone who really knows the code base and can basically be reviewing things. Now, this is where things get a little bit sticky, okay? You know, they say, yeah, you know, there's, there's many books and courses that are available to help them understand uh, how, to, how to design, you know, secure software. And they give an example of one of these courses, okay? So I looked into this secure uh, software development fundamentals course. It's actually free, but if you want a, a certificate, you got to pay for it. It's a few hundred dollars. But it looks to be like, you know, like a three credit level, college level, uh, one semester course. So it's a pretty significant investment to take that course. So more recently, um, I was looking around the Open SSF Best Practices Working Group site, and they've, they've got this concise guide for developing more secure software. Uh, and one of those is, you know, learning about secure software. So they give a couple different examples of, you know, ways that you can learn about secure software. And the lowest overhead one, which is fairly new, is this free open SSF course. And that one is 18 hours every two years. And that looks to be the least time consuming of all the options that, that, that they've given. Um, yeah, so the question is, is software security important enough uh, for our projects that we need to have one person on our project devote 18 hours every two years to uh, you know, being recertified in this course so that you can legitimately check yes on that. So I should say that, you know, prior to this, I was not willing to take a college level course on this, but I think I am willing to devote 18 hours just to see what's, what's in this course. And then I'm going to write a blog article and put it on the Better Scientific, or I'll submit it to the Better Scientific Software site and see what I've learned here. So the last one is, well, not the last one, but the other really difficult one is, you know, know the common kinds of errors. 
that can exist in the software that you're producing. Uh, there's lots of different categories, and they mentioned classic buffer overflow. Uh, there's a couple of different sites that they mention. So one of the more interesting ones is this uh, CWE SANS Top 25. And then of course they mention this, uh, you know, secure software design fundamentals course to teach you about these security vulnerability areas in more detail. Presumably if you took that course, you could check, you know, you could check uh, this thing as well. So let's look at the, the 2022 um, version of, of this uh, CWE SANS top 25. So these are reported, this is some kind of survey that they do or study that they do to look at the top security vulnerabilities that are reported in software. I don't know if this, this is just open source software, I can't remember. But I picked out, uh, so it, if you go to that site and, um, and look at the table there, I picked out nine of the 25 that I think definitely relate to a lot of our CSC, HPC software, even just the core computational software that we're writing. So I'll note that five of the top 11, uh, like, you know, out of bounds write, out of bounds read, and proper input validation, using after free, pointer reference. These things are incredibly common in all of our CSC software. Everybody that, has, that, that writes software in C and C++ and Fortran experience these things all the time. And there's a lot of these bugs that are still latent in a lot of our software. It, it's guaranteed. Um, and but, but what I will note about this is that um, you know many of many of these issues are not just security vulnerabilities, but they're also major causes of software bugs impacting our software correctness that can cause our computational software to give the wrong answer or to crash the simulation. Um, yeah, or just the general robustness of our software. So one thing that I've, I've kind of come to realize is that I think you can draw the conclusion that software correctness and quality and software security are really best friends. That if you're focusing on, on you know, your core software, if it's not a security critical software, if you focus on the things that affect software correctness, like these top five right here, um, you're also, making your software a lot more secure. Um, and all of us want to have software that we can trust and rely on. And even if we're not primarily concerned about software security. All right, so in summary, the openness of the best practices uh, program provides a set of actual criteria that you could argue that is the open source community's you know, you know, curated best practices. And the best practices badge site you know, it helps you to codify these best practices and to, you know, list those out and provide fields to fill in how your projects or how projects address each of these best practices and whether they follow them or not. And, and then once you've got an entry for a project, you can create, a, you can display a badge on the project's hosting sites to show that your project follows those, best, those, those accepted best practices. Uh, the badge app site contains features to help your project continue in its uh, process improvement as you, you know, are able to meet un, you know, you know, prior unmet uh, practices and improve on the existing practices that, that you have. It sends out regular email reminders to help you with that. And I, you know, for looking at this before, I thought, you know, I thought that we could have a project potentially in some of our institutions to actually fork the implementation for the badge app site and then make modifications for some of the from the practices that for less than open source software that are more particular to some of our larger programs and that could have a lot of benefit. And just in the end there, I'll just uh, say, you know, these best practices uh, badge program, it elevates security to first level concern for everyone that's developing software. Um, and so the, the real question that I have that I wanna try to answer here is, and, and a lot of us are gonna to need to answer for our various projects is what is the minimum level of sufficient knowledge of developing secure software? And one thing that to think about things like this DOE order about software security, there may come a time where there's a certain set of security practices that have to be followed for software or they won't even be allowed to run on government controlled systems. And there may be a day that comes where, where that happens. So to the extent that we can be you know, sort of minimally proactive 
in addressing security, we may be able to avoid some of those problems. And finally, you know, a suggestion I would have, which is a challenge is for people that are here is, you know, go ahead and go up on the Badge app site and create an entry for your project and just see how you do on some of those. What you'll find is that a lot of things you're not doing that are, that are actually pretty easy to do. And you know, it probably has some value for your project and for your users and stakeholders, so you can actually do them. And then you can sort of confront some of these questions that I've that I've put here in terms of, again, you know, is there somebody on your, on your project that really knows how to design secure software and what that means for the kind of software that you're developing? So with that, we're at the end of our, of our time here and I'll accept any, or try to answer any questions or comments that you might have. Hey, um... Uh, Ross, yes, there is one here. So does the badge get reset every 18 months? Sorry, what? Does the badge get reset every 18 months? I don't think so. Did you see somewhere where it is reset every 18 months? No, I think it was because we, you know, you talked about the training, I think. Oh, the training. Yeah, but I think they're basically going, look, they're not, look, any of those practices can go from being met to unmet. And they're basically, in that particular area, they are going on, um, on your own uh, best faith effort and, and due diligence to have, you know, have met the criteria for the practice. So I suspect for some projects, you probably don't need to be recertified every two years. Um, but I think that's something that we have to ask. I mean, a lot of us are not developing security critical applications. So I, I wouldn't think that I would need to take that again for the kind of projects that I'm working on, I wouldn't think. There was another question. Are the two books that you mentioned the only good ones on software security? Oh, no, those, those are not even good books on software security. Uh, there's many good books I've written on software security. I'm not an expert on software security, obviously. I was just pointing out that those are very popular general books on software engineering and they're very sparse on software security. That's what I was pointing out. Yeah. I think we still have a few minutes left to hear. So the speakers, uh, I mean, participants would like to unmute themselves and ask directly to, uh, to Ross. Any further questions? who uh, folks who are um, with it, still with us can unmute or write in the chat. <laughs> well, Ross, we just had a little discussion about the security issue and, that, and thanks for the answer. I think it, it's just put on the, um, the owner of the repository to update that if they need to. I mean, the other problem was what if the person who has the security knowledge leaves the project? Yeah, I so think have... that goes in that too. Yeah, I mean, I think that those are great questions. Uh, but again, I mean, any of the practices could go away, right? I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean, you might have, for example, a static analysis tool running on your project right now, which is required to meet the passing level. But you know that, but but your process of using that tool might go away at some point. So your 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 project might legitimately not be passing anymore. And you know, I guess what it would say is that if your project says that it's passing everything, I means somebody could go and click on your links and they could go to verify that you're not actually following those practices. Which means so it I mean so this is going on, you know, sort of you know the honest, you know, the honest scout kind of thing, right? Where you basically are being honest about uh, these things because these things can be these things can be checked on, right? You're required to provide evidence and links to URLs for, you know, for evidence of these things. And, you know, and if I go to your dashboard and if I don't see any static analysis results, I don't think you're running static analysis. Or if you say you're running dynamic analysis, but I don't see any dynamic analysis showing up on your dashboard, I'm gonna question whether or not you're actually running the dynamic analysis, for example. So I have a question too on how to get started and the hesitancy to, to have it out there that I'm not, <laughs> I am, or I haven't filled out part of it or whatever. 
Well, so I'll I look just kind really of, bad. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just, um, yeah, I mean, if you're in the process of getting a badge, I think that's okay. But you should probably, you know, devote half a day to go through it and see what you, and, and just see what you've already um, accepted. Because I think it probably says more for your project that you're making a good faith effort to kind of work on these practices than if there's no entry there at all. Okay, thank you, Ross. Thank you all for joining us today. I'll just stop the recording.